Hello and welcome to a brand new Arsblog Arscast, right here on Arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're well. We are going into the final game of the Premier League season, almost a year after the season started. It's ending. It is ending, and maybe not too soon from a Premier League point of view. Of course, Arsenal still have the FA Cup to play for. And that's something, obviously, that we hope will be a cause for celebration. Not only will we win a trophy, but we'll have European football next season. We can celebrate that, and that's good. But in Premier League terms, this one has been a bit of a bust. But before I go into that, and before I go into what this season has has brought us or wrought upon us, I just want to tell you that we have a competition a little bit later in the show where you can win. A uh, brand new Arsenal home shirt. You can have the uh, men's shirt. You can have the women's shirt if you're a woman. You can have the goalkeeper's shirt if you are a goalkeeper or if you just like the goalkeeper shirt, which I do. I really like the goalkeeper shirt. So whatever uh, iteration of the Arsenal home kit you would like, we will give it to you today. Well, we won't give it to you today. We'll give you a chance to win it today. We'll announce it next week, and we will get the shirt sent out to one of our uh, wonderful listeners who we're always very glad to have on board. Thank you for being here as ever. Thanks for subscribing, sharing, and all that kind of stuff. We also have a couple of shirts to give away exclusively to our Patreon members as well uh, at patreon.com forward slash arsblog. You guys keep an eye out on the Patreon page, and I will put up details of how you enter that competition. So, You can enter this competition, and if you're a Patreon member, you get extra chances to win one of the shirts. So there you go. Right. I was going to talk a little bit about this season, about the 2019-20 season from an Arsenal perspective. And I was just thinking about some of the stuff that happened, some of the things that went on. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to forget stuff when I go through this. But it's fucking mental. This season has been unlike any other I have ever known. As an Arsenal fan, there have been many, many things have happened down the years at Arsenal, on the pitch, off the pitch. There's been upheaval, there's been periods of stability, there's been great success, there's been frustration. But I cannot remember a season that has been anything, anything like this. So I'm just sort of going through stuff. Uh, I made a couple of notes here. If I've forgotten things, I apologize, but it's only because of the amount of stuff that's happened that things just kind of get lost in the mists a little bit. And let's go back. Let's go back in time to around this time last year, last July. Uh, Right now, uh, this day, last July, Arsenal were on tour in the U.S., uh, they play games in L.A., in Charlotte, and in uh, in Washington, D.C., or outside Washington, D.C. But our captain was not on that tour, because before the tour, he basically torched nine years of his Arsenal legacy by refusing to go on the tour and forcing a move. Well, forcing a move. He just did not want to play for Arsenal anymore. He said discussions have been going on for months. The club acted all surprised. And all of a sudden, we had this massive issue with Lauren Koscielny. He did not go on the tour and uh, ultimately ended up being sold to Bordeaux. To replace him, we brought in David Luiz from... Chelsea, who had just signed a new contract at Chelsea. David Luiz, of course, represented by Kia Jurabchian, who's been a long time uh, working relationship or has had a long time working relationship with Edu, who's our technical director, and Raul Sanyehi, who is the head of football. Kia Jurabchian has watched games from our director's box this season, which, of course, is a really, really, really healthy place for a super agent to be. Going back to the US and while we were over there, we spent a lot of money, surprisingly. We spent £72 million on Nicolas Pepe, a signing that nobody thought was Uh, possible or that Arsenal were going to do anything like that in the transfer market. Of course, there was the We Care, Do You stuff that went on last summer as well. And we get to the start of the season and it goes, okay, we start with a couple of wins and then we sell one of our best defenders, Nacho Monreal, the day before the North London derby, which we draw. Then we have that Watford game, that Watford game. You know the one I'm talking about, the one that is still etched into your brain where we're 2-0 up and we we, we play in a, a way which I, 
I don't know, whatever little faith I had left in Unai Emery, it was gone after that game. Watford had 3,000 attempts on goal in the last or in the second half. It was just bananas. And the pressure is mounting. It's beginning to mount on Unai Emery because we're not playing very well. We play against Liverpool in the EFL Cup. We draw five all and lose on penalties. Nuts. Pressure continues to grow. There's a 2-2 draw with Crystal Palace. The Granite Xhaka thing happens. Without wanting to open up the whole thing again, I mean, that was crazy. That was absolutely crazy. It was a consequence of a lot more than just what happened at Crystal Palace. Unai Emery's delaying the decision to give him the captaincy. All of that stuff played into it. Xhaka told the fans to fuck off. All the shit hit all the fans. Xhaka didn't play for us for a while. Uh, pressure continues to grow on Unai Emery. Shaka comes back in what turns out to be Emery's last game, a 2-1 win, uh, or 2-1 defeat, rather, to Eintracht Frankfurt in the Europa League. Before that, though, as fans are, are upset and worried about where the season is going, we're in mid-table, the form has gone through the toilet, the club are backing Unai Emery. They're, you know, through the back channels, through the briefing to the media, they're saying everything is, is okay. We are 100% behind Unai Emery. They dismiss fan sentiment as noise as noise but of course it it was more than that it was just fans who were really really worried about what was happening to their football club eventually they had to see what was going on they did see they came to their senses Unai Emery was relieved of his duties in November so what did we do we put Freddie Jumberg in charge a former player a legend who everybody loves we put him in charge with no help and no staff whatsoever. We took the academy manager, Per Mertesacker, and we we put him in the dugout, along with a goalkeeping coach and maybe the tea lady. And that was it. Freddie did his best. But it was tough. It was a really difficult situation that he found himself in. Uh, in the games that he was in charge, we drew with Norwich. We lost to Brighton. We beat West Ham. We drew with Standard Liège. And then we lost 3-0 to Manchester City in one of the most dispiriting, insipid performances uh, Uh, that I can remember happening. And that's not on Freddie, by the way. That's because of the way uh, that the season had been managed and and everything else. At that game, of course, Mikel Arteta was in the dugout alongside Pep Guardiola. Arsenal had been having secret conversations, secret meetings with Mikel Arteta. Manchester City were furious. They were so angry. They get very angry, though. They're a touchy bunch of cunts up there at the best of times, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. But, of course, Mikel Arteta then was brought in, and he was he was uh, making the right noises about changing the culture and all of that kind of stuff. In a weird quirk of fate, Arteta's first game in charge, or as the manager, even though he didn't take charge of the game, was at Everton. His former club, Freddie, took charge of that game, and it was a nil-nil draw. You know, we had some good results under Arteta. Uh, You know, there were some uh, reasonable performances. We beat Manchester United 2-0. You might remember that. Then there was the Chelsea game where we went down to 10 men. And, you know, it was going okay. There were ups and downs. You could see how there was a bit of progress. Arteta brought back Granit Xhaka. He was on the verge of leaving. On the way to Hertha Berlin, he changed his mind, told him to stay. And Xhaka pretty much rehabilitated himself, you know, in the eyes of, of many fans because of the way that he played. He became important under Mikel Arteta. Arteta made Mustafi, a guy who nobody wanted to see in the team, a serviceable Premier League player with some measure of consistency. Who would have thought that was coming? We get to the January transfer window and we bring in a central defender who used to be at Manchester City but never met Mikel Arteta while he was there but spent most of his career in the Spanish second division before moving to Flamengo in Brazil where he uh, stood out and did very well. His agent uh, Arturo Canales was Unai Emery's agent, who's a good friend of Raul Sanyehi's. He came over to England. Everything was being done. Then he went back to Brazil because we didn't have the money. Then all of a sudden we did find the money somehow, somewhere. And he came back and became a loan signing in January, even though he wasn't quite ready to play because of the, you know, the Brazilian season ending when it did. Oh, and we also brought in Cedric Suarez. Uh, a right back from Southampton with less than six months left on his contract. We spent in the region of five million pounds between, you know, loan fees and wages and all that kind of stuff to bring him in, his agent, uh, Kia Jarabchian, as well. Uh, Cedric Suarez arrived to sign for Arsenal on loan in a knee brace. In a knee brace. Shades of Kim Shellstrom arriving at Arsenal with a broken back. Suarez was never fit enough to play before lockdown. And even after lockdown, he got a broken face and couldn't play for a few weeks then either. 
going back to where we were, the ups and downs that we were having, the form fluctuating a bit, but any ups we have as Arsenal Football Club, there's something contractually uh, involved in this. I think it's a deal that somebody at the football club did with Satan. Any good you get, you have to have a bit of bad as well. So there are ups and downs. So we go out of the Europa League in the 119th minute. The 119th minute uh, at home to Olympiacos. And Aubameyang misses a chance, I think, uh, just after they score. And that would have sent us through. But unfortunately, he just couldn't find the target from a place he would normally put the ball away. 99 times out of 100, you would expect him to score that goal. So we're out of Europe. At the same time, there's a worldwide pandemic spreading across the globe. Is it going to shut down football? What's going to happen? Is it just going to be consigned to certain areas? We don't know what's going on, but it's all a bit scary and weird. After the Olympiacos game, it turns out that the Olympiacos Olympiacos president tested positive for the coronavirus. Well, what does that mean for Arsenal? Well, it meant that our game against Manchester City, which was due to take place on the Wednesday, was cancelled. Then it turns out Mikel Arteta himself got coronavirus. Holy shit, our manager has coronavirus. That precipitated the shutdown of football and sport in England. We enter three months of lockdown, lockdown. Nobody knows what the fuck is happening, how long we're going to be locked down, how long sport is going to be away, when we're going to be able to go out again, when we're going to be able to return to something approaching normality. It's three months. It feels like six months. It feels like nine months. And all the time, we've got no football. We've no football whatsoever to keep us going, to entertain us. And then there's talk of football behind closed doors and fake crowd noise and fake sounds and fake fans and all of that kind of stuff. Eventually, football starts again with a game against Manchester City, which we lose 3-0, which is par for the course. In that, one of our defensive signings that we uh, made official, Pablo Marie, suffers a, a significant, a serious injury. Of course, Callum Chambers had picked up a cruciate injury uh, back in January, so the injuries are mounting up for Mikel Arteta. We, we uh, go to our next game, which of course is against Brighton. We lose to Brighton. We lose our goalkeeper, Bernd Leno, who's been one of our best players all season. We lose him to a pointless needless injury, we've got to replace him with Emi Martinez, a guy who at 27 years of age has barely played for the club, even though he's been here for 10 years. How are we supposed to cope without Bernd Leno? Holy shit, Emi Martinez is really fucking good. Then we go and we play, uh, what do we do? We beat Southampton 2-0, away from home, away from home. What the fuck is this? 2-1 win against Sheffield United in the FA Cup, 4-0 win against Norwich. We beat Wolves 2-0 away from home. This is actually quite good. Then this 10-man Arsenal drawing with Leicester. Then we lose a North London derby. There's more bad news on the injury front as Gabriel Martinelli is ruled out until 2021. Oh no, what is happening here? And now after losing the North London derby, we've got to face the champions, Liverpool. And then we've got Manchester City who always beat us 3-0 in the FA Cup semi-final. That's a fucking shitter of a week. Chances are that's not going to turn out well for us. Oh, Oh, we've beaten Liverpool 2-1-0. Oh, and we've beaten Manchester City. Now we're in the FA Cup final. We are in the FA Cup final. We're in the FA Cup. We're in. We are in the FA Cup final. The FA Cup final at the end of this crazy, lunatic, surreal, bizarre mad season. We are in the FA Cup final. We still have a chance, though, of course, to qualify for Europe via the Premier League. Uh, No, we don't anymore because we've lost 1-0 to an Aston Villa side and we don't even have a shot on target. Um, I know that there are things that I have forgotten. I know there are. But this season, Arsenal fired a manager They gave the job temporarily to a guy who's never managed a game in his life. They gave the job on a full-time basis to a guy who had never managed a football game in his life. He then had to deal with injury suspensions, a worldwide pandemic, a squad that was a complete and utter mess, uh, football behind closed doors. Oh, oh, don't forget, don't forget, of course, that within uh, two weeks or so of the pandemic uh, becoming a reality, if you like, or whatever, the lockdown happening and, and sport being cancelled, Arsenal... Still, to this day, the only club to have uh, made their players take a pay cut. There have been deferrals and all kinds of stuff. But within literally a couple of weeks, Arsenal are putting pressure on the players to take a 12.5% pay cut. That's another fucking clusterfuck for Mikel Arteta to have to have dealt with. It has just been so crazy. 
so crazy. And whatever happens against Watford on Sunday, I, for one, will be glad to see the back of this Premier League season. I don't know how normal next season is going to be, but I suspect that even if there are elements that aren't quite what we expect, it can't be anywhere near as nuts as this one, can it? Can it? Can't, please. No. I mean, it can't, surely. Are those famous last words? Am I tempting fate? I don't know. I don't know. But there's a book to be written about the 2019-20 season. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do that. But hopefully, hopefully, the final chapter of that book involves Arsenal, however they do it, and I don't care how, once they do, beating Chelsea at Wembley to lift the FA Cup. I feel... Like, that would be the only true way for this story to end properly. It's all been so unlikely and all so implausible that actually finishing this season with a trophy is the only right way for it to happen. So come on, Arsenal, and let's do that next weekend at Wembley. Whew. Right. Keep your ears open for the competition to win a home shirt of any description a little bit later on. But first, after a a disappointing week on the pitch and lots of focus on stats and chance creation and creativity and lack of it and tactics and all that kind of stuff, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show the man who writes the tactics column on arsblog.com. It's Lewis Ambrose. Hi, Lewis. Hi, Andrew. Let's talk a little bit about chance creation, because that is something that has been in the the online discourse, if you like, over the last um, few days, particularly in the wake of the Aston Villa game where we didn't have a shot on target. I'll go, I'll go to some of the stats in, in just a little bit, but without wanting to reopen the whole Mesut Ozil debate again, because Andrew Allen and I had a chat about that uh, on the podcast earlier in the week, so people can go back and, and listen to that if they want. You know, you can understand why people are clamoring for a creative player in this team, because, you know, it's obvious that that's something that, that we're missing. But on the basis that I think most people would accept that with the defenders we have available to us right now, a back three is probably the most um, solid uh, system that we can use defensively. It has, generally speaking, made us a bit more solid defensively, and we've cut out some of the most of the nonsense, if not all of it. How does, not Mesut Ozil, but a player like Mesut Ozil or of his profile fit into that kind of formation or does he um i think i think a player like like that always can and i do think if the if the back three which i'd agree with you that the back three has given us some more security some more stability so if you think we have to play with it um for the time being that's obviously what michael Arteta has decided then that's firstly you know you've only got a limited number of positions then beyond that where creative creativity can come from mm. the the wing backs obviously have to provide and i think that's probably in terms of creating chances and looking dangerous it's probably the position that arsenal fans will probably be most satisfied with um kieran tierney Bukayo Saka, uh hector bellerin uh, angley maitland niles at wembley have all at different times looked dangerous to varying degrees then you've got in the front three, you, you've got in Aubameyang a pure goal scorer. I, I think we can all call him that mm. and agree that that's what he is. And then, yeah, beyond that, you're looking for more from the, the central midfielders, but they've got a lot of ground to cover and you're looking for more from the, the rest of the front three. I go back to the last time we played Chelsea in an FA Cup final and we were playing a similar sort of system to this and the front three was at the time, Danny Welbeck or Olivier Giroud. In the cup final, it was Danny Welbeck mm. with um, Mesut Ozil to bring him up again and Alexis Sanchez either side of him. And I think that's where you need that that creativity. This is a system that that relies on the, the dynamism of the wing-backs, but then it demands a lot of flexibility from the, the rest of the players, the sort of attacking wide players in that front three and mm. also the central midfielders, I think, to a lesser extent. You can have them shielding the back three, which in some games, Man City, Liverpool is more necessary than others. Or you can have them 
bombing on. I mean, if you look at that Arsenal team back then, Aaron Ramsey was, was one of those players. And I think there's a real mixture of issues at Arsenal mm. um, it, when it comes to not creating enough. And one is, for me, the personnel. There's just there aren't players that create lots of chances. But the other one is actually the the type of players we have in a very strange way because they're not these playmaker types. And for years there was that, that I mean, nonsense, frankly, about all of the exact same type of player go, uh, that was signed every single summer. Yeah. Think of Fleb and Najri and Rosicki and Fabregas. Uh, we don't really have any of those players, yet somehow we still have players that want the ball. Um, who are you, you, who think are you of, thinking of in in that regard? Uh, I'm thinking of, of, well, pretty much all of them. I'm thinking of Alex Lacazette. I'm thinking of Nicola Pepe and further back, uh, Granit Xhaka and Danny Ceballos. If you compare them to a Najri or a Fleb, there's not much ingenuity there. I think Ceballos provides it from deeper, but in terms of getting close and around the box and mm. forging chances. But I'm also thinking of how there's nobody there. Joe Willock's the only one that you might suggest who plays like Aaron Ramsey uh, as opposed to playing like Jack Wilshere. Um, and something that Ramsey was so valuable for was he's running off the ball and Wilshere or whoever Ramsey was playing with Ozil, they would get space because Ramsey would, would take defenders away. But he'd also give them someone to aim for. And I think if you are if you put... Oh, I think, oh, this Arsenal team will be so much better if you put Cesc Fabregas of, of yesteryear in it. Sure. But, <laughs> but there's, I don't really see anyone for him to provide at the same time. Mm. What um, about other than Aubameyang? What about you know this this idea of Aubameyang being played on the left, which I know frustrates a lot of people because you know the the majority of his goals come from central areas, and you know his movement from that side into the penalty area is often devastating and and hugely effective. So you can sort of see both sides of that one. But you know he likes uh, a traditional centre forward or something approaching that anyway, and number nine which is sort of the job that Lacazette is doing. I mean, is there a case to be made that if you're getting your creativity and your your width from your wingbacks, whoever they might be, that you could fit an Ozil-type player as a sort of a number 10 in, in what might be considered a 3-4-1-2 um, you know, formation? In the kind of the role that Lacazette's been playing. Sort of, um, yeah. Like a one, a creative player behind two strikers, essentially. And you've got then two, two narrow forwards with the wingbacks providing the width outside. Yeah, I think with the back three, I think there's really two ways you can go about it. And you can stick with Aubameyang wide uh, or wider uh, with with a, a central player to sort of pivot. And that we talk about it in midfield sometimes where that triangle is either one holder or two holders and it's mm. sort of, and you can flip that triangle with the front three as well and play a bit more with two two strikers if you like I don't think they'd quite be two centre forwards but yeah the two yeah. strikers who maybe peel wide and provide some sort of width but are pretty much playing in the width of the 18 yard box um, but I think it I think it can work both ways I think Personally, ultimately, it's largely a personnel issue. And I don't think, obviously, we want to win the league. We want to not not even just fight for the top four. We want to just belong in the top four and be in the top four every season again. Mm. Um, and, and from there, go on to fight for the Premier League. But I don't think, obviously, that takes a, a certain level of player. I don't think it takes a certain level of player just to improve Arsenal a fair bit from where we are right now. I know that not everybody agrees with that and not everybody um, sees him the same way that I do, but I liked Alex Awobi and I think just by virtue of being different to everything else we have right now, and obviously I'm not saying we shouldn't have sold Alex Awobi because we've got a brilliant fee for him. He's not had a brilliant season for Everton, but just by virtue of being a different player to everything else that's at the club, I think it would have been really interesting to see him at the moment and then you maybe have a bit more freedom to move about Yang Central. I don't mm. think that's ever going to happen under Mikel Arteta. Um, but I just think the I think the squad is so strangely put together that there's a real 
it's just a real odd mix of players. There's there are no there's no one that sort of bursts into space, but there are also very very few players, Pepe and Ceballos, but again from a deeper position who sort of will, will take the ball and beat a man or two, and at times look for that killer pass. And I think it's just yeah, it's it's led to a very stunted looking Arsenal. Uh, Arteta spoke uh, this week or, uh, or at the end of last week about you know the pragmatic way that he has to manage this squad because of the injuries that we have because of you know the squad issues that we have and I think we all can see that there are uh, gaps in terms of personnel and that there are certain types of player that could come into this squad and I I kind of agree with your contention um, you know that it wouldn't take a great deal to make Arsenal. Um, quite a bit better. Um, I think we've got a long, long way to get to being a team that can challenge for the title. But I do think, in terms of improving Arsenal enough to be, uh, you know, fighting at least for a top four place, you know, I think that's within our wheelhouse. And you build uh, on top of that. But ultimately, where do you see Mikel Arteta's Arsenal going? I know we're speculating here, but do you see the back three as something that he is going to want to work with? into next season or is it a case that his longer term vision is about getting more attacking players on the pitch being a bit more proactive finding a way for example to win games against the likes of Aston Villa against the likes of Brighton against whom we've uh, fallen in recent weeks for various reasons but those are if you like your bread and butter games I think when you're playing a team like Liverpool when you're playing a team like Manchester City and you're a team in the in, in the state that Arsenal is in you know your tactical options are limited right you're not going to go out and try and dominate possession and play expansively because you just get picked apart and you get absolutely hammered so the way that Arteta approached those two games was more or less the only way he could do it but day to day week to week in terms of beating teams in the Premier League that that Arsenal fans would have traditionally an expectation of of beating how do you think he's going to approach that um i, I definitely long term i'd see him wanting to play with as many attacking players as possible. Um, I see Mikel Arteta like, like the coaches he has worked with, Arsene Wenger in, at the end of his playing career and then Pep Guardiola as a coach. I think he's very much in that mould um, of uh, uh, there's a right way to play football and that's his vision. And I do think right now the way we're setting up is because with the players that we have, I think he probably, the players and the time that he's had to work with them, I don't think he believes he can get much more out of them going forward. And I think the quickest way to improve this team for the last couple of months of the season was just to limit how many goals and chances they're conceding. Mm. And if we're keeping a clean sheet, then we've just got to score one. Um, I don't think that's what Mikel Arteta wants from football. And you see the way he was as a player himself as well, playing in midfield and completing 80, 90, 100 passes a game. Mm. That's, as as far as I'm concerned, from everything he's told us and post David Moyes, from everywhere that he, he played and has worked as well. I definitely think that is how Mikel Arteta sees football. I think that he probably has some sort of, and, and again, we are obviously speculating, um, I imagine Mikel Arteta's football upbringing coming through the Academy of Barcelona and yeah. you now working with Wenger and Guardiola, but also having that range time with Rangers and the time with Everton. I see his football, I guess, I personally think the impression I have is that his idealistic football is, is a sort of Wenger-Guardiola football, but with a, a more gritty edge to it, probably. Um, I think Mikel Arteta probably gets quite a lot of joy out of watching his players battle and fight in a typically English sense, if you want to put it like that. Yeah. Um, more than I would probably say Wenger did, uh, and maybe in a more obvious way, in a less blatantly cynical way than Pep Guardiola does. Uh, what I don't know is how long it might take us to get there, because obviously the, there's huge doubts about what there might be to spend this summer, whether or not Aubameyang or Lacazette will be there next season. I think at the moment, yeah, we're not seeing, I'm absolutely certain we're not seeing 
Mikel Arteta's vision of a football team. And I I do worry that it might we might be a long way from seeing that uh, and too long of a way from seeing it to, to really get a good picture of it, maybe even through parts of next season. I mean, it is. it does feel like a big project, uh, a big rebuilding project, because when you look at where Arsenal might finish this season, it is 10th. It's the worst, uh, whether we finish t- uh, 10th or 8th, which is the highest we can finish, it will be the worst since 1995-96. Um, I'm not going to open up the debate with you about how the football club is being run and what has led us to this particular point. I, you know, that's something we've, we've done before. Um but it does suggest that the job of getting Arsenal back to where we want it to be, and and I think what's interesting is where Mikel Arteta wants it to be as well. He has said very clearly uh, that it's not good enough to be where we are. He even said today at his press conference that winning the FA Cup and finishing eighth would not be a good season as far as he's concerned because you know Arsenal uh, aren't where he wants them to be. He's, he's called this... Um, this path that lies ahead of him he's called it a beautiful challenge uh, which I think is <laughs> quite an ugly challenge I think isn't it I think in the in the very short term it could be a bit of an ugly challenge but I think what he's looking for is the is the reward at the end of that so you know in terms of his in terms of his overall vision he certainly seems very clear about what he wants for the football club how he's going to get it there must surely be a, a staggered process like it's not as if the new season is going to kick off. I do we know exactly when? Is it like mid September, something yeah, like that? I don't think there's an official. Date there isn't yet. A, an yeah. official date yet. So you know, it's not as if we're going to go away, have a preseason, and come back, and everyone's going to go, "Whoa, what did they get up to during preseason?" There's like two or three weeks off, and then we go again with more or less. Uh, the same personnel as we had this season, obviously, and we hope that there will be some changes. So it, it is going to be a case that, that he's he's going to have to put building blocks in and the improvements might be minimal, but as long as they're improvements, that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I think that was a big thing with the year and a half that Unai Emery was in charge, um, aside from maybe the results in the first three or four months, is it never felt like we were building towards something. Mm. Um, and I think as a fan, that's sort of the least that you, you can ask for something to hold on to something to cling on to. You want to watch them and they're better than they were two months ago. And as long as you're following that trajectory, yeah, it might take three or four or five years. Um, but that's sort of all you can hope for, I guess. With nobody, no, nobody in their right mind could possibly think that Arsenal are going to compete for the Premier League next season. No. Um, and it is a big challenge. The squad is so strange as well, isn't it? Like, the, you've got a mix of guys who are sort of late 20s, early 30s, and then a collection of promising teenagers. Mm. And it just sort of, yeah, you like, what is that? W- which direction do you go with them? Yeah. Well, when you look at the squad and, and squad building, um, I mean, I was looking at it thinking today – that there are probably only four or five, maybe six players in that squad who are completely and utterly unsellable. I think it's one of your goalkeepers. Uh, I'm going to ask you about that now in a minute. You've got Kieran Tierney. You've got Pablo Marie from the point of view that he is he's a recent arrival. We don't quite know what he is yet. Um, Bukayo Saka, Martinelli. William Saliba coming in and then I think after that if you're Arsenal and you're in the process of a rebuild you've got to be open to considering offers for pretty much everybody else in that squad it's a kind of amazing thing to to think about when it wasn't long ago you know when we would talk um amongst ourselves as Arsenal fans and say, well, look, if we could only just get one or two players, the one or two players that we could add to this squad, and now you've sort of gone so far the other we've, way. We've got the one or two players now. Yeah, we've, we're just we've got missing everybody else. We just need the 23 around them. Yeah, you know. But it is it is going to be uh, an interesting, I say summer, because we're already in the summer, but, but transfer period, I guess we'll have to call it because of because of the way COVID-19 has has impacted things. But, you know, this is a club that is going to have to make some probably tough decisions with some players that ordinarily you might want to hang on to, but because of the circumstances, 
may be expendable. Yeah, I think it's very considering um, the the financial position the club finds itself in now. I think it's very hard, or it would be very hard, mm. to justify keeping Aubameyang and Lacazette, for example, yeah. um, both at the the end of their careers or coming up to the end of their careers. Uh, the at the back, yeah, you say Tierney, Saliba. But other than that, yeah, we're, every player has to have a price because if we don't sell well, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, that's that's going to be absolutely crucial uh, going forward now, to because just simply because of the amount of work that has to be done to the squad. With regard to the Aubameyang Lacazette thing, I'm guessing that your preference, if you had to keep one, would be Aubameyang. Is that right? Um. I think so, and um, and and not because of the the whole Mesut Ozil thing. No, no. But um, but I am. There is a part of me that does fear giving a, a thirty year old a big contract. I think strikers, especially, did. And for every striker that is poor at thirty two, suddenly there there is a striker that isn't, um, like Jamie Vardy or Didier Drogba, or yeah. you know, there are guys that, that still have it or still still score lots of goals at that end of their career. But there are also a lot of guys who aren't. Um, and I don't think that's entirely to do with pace uh, or fitness. I think I think it just happens. It, time comes for everybody eventually, and the cruel, cruel thing is that you can't see when it's going to happen. And giving a as much as I think Aubameyang is obviously brilliant, he's he's by some distance I would say the best player at the club. Uh, but if I think there's definitely. If, if Arsenal can't get a good offer for Lacazette, if Arsenal, say, can't sell Lacazette for more than 20 million this summer, but somebody's willing to spend 25, 30 million on Aubameyang, then the the question becomes much, much more difficult to answer, I would say. Mm. So you, you're cautious about the, the new deal. Would you be as cautious about the new deal if we hadn't seen the Mesut Ozil thing play out in front of our eyes? And I know there are more reasons to... Uh, Ozil's decline than simply his contract, but the 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 fact that it coincided quite notably with that, it it does sort of scar you a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, um, and I don't if if Aubameyang were to stay or if he were to leave, um, and the next three years of his career aren't as good as the last three, I don't think the reasons would be exactly the same as, or or even mm. close to the same as the reasons the Mesut Ozil's career has gone the way it has. Um, I just think you have to be wary at some point at that age and especially um, we keep seeing the club linked with Willian on a three-year contract as well and you just sort of think well if we have more players of that age then it's inevitable that some of them are going to fall off a cliff and the the end of their careers are just around the corner really um, yeah I obviously replacing Aubameyang and the goals that he scores would be a huge, huge concern. Um, but the the underlying numbers over the past couple of seasons have already sort of started to trend downwards for him. You, it's hard to say, is that because he's getting older or is that because Arsenal have been awful? It's yeah. just something that I think has, to, has yeah. to come into the thinking, at least when they're making that decision. And if they can get 25, 30 million for Lacazette and some of that money goes into the Aubameyang thing, then go for it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the counter-argument to some of the underlying numbers going one way is that he is still scoring a remarkable number of mm-hmm. goals for a team which, as we've said, just doesn't create chances or doesn't create any, anywhere near enough chances. Uh, the stats uh, that came out this week had, had Arsenal in 16th uh, in the Premier League in terms of chances created, which is 288 chances compared to Manchester City top of the table, top of that particular table, obviously not top of the table overall, uh, with 588 followed by Chelsea and, and Liverpool. I did laugh when I saw Watford ahead of us um, with 290 chances, not simply because we're playing them this weekend, but about 200 of those chances came in the second half of that <laughs> game earlier in the season. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Let me ask you about goalkeepers. 
Emmy Martinez has taken his chance as well as anybody could be expected to take a chance when he's, you know, gone through what he's gone, well, gone through, but but it's sort of had the career trajectory that he has had as a, a number two, number three at Arsenal for a long time, some loan moves which didn't really work out. You know, he, he went to uh, various clubs and didn't play as much as Arsenal would have liked and certainly not as much as, as he would have liked and at 26, 27 years of age. You wonder, you have questions about a goalkeeper like that, that you know, if he hasn't really established himself as a number one at that point, or even as a number two, I think it's reasonable to have some doubts about him. But he's he's come into the team and he's played absolutely brilliantly. He has um, sent his stock through the roof. If he were a stock market, if he were a you know a commodity that that could be traded, which you know ultimately I suppose he is. Um, Burned Leno, uh, probably one of our best players this season behind Aubameyang because of the amount of saves that he makes. And that, of course, ties into how defensively insecure Arsenal are. We we felt terrible when he got that injury against Brighton because we all knew how important he was. I'm not going to ask you necessarily to choose between the two because I think the sample size with, with Emmy is still very small. And that's something that Mikel Arteta has, has emphasised a couple of times. But when you're a club that is in need of money, and and let's be, you know, let's be realistic, Arsenal could be going into next season with no European football at all, and there are financial implications because of that. Obviously, we hope that's not the case because if we win the FA Cup, we'll have had some success. We have a trophy. We have European football. So it's not a question of saying, you know, uh, just just seeing the negative. But I think we have to we have to be realistic enough to to consider that that is a possibility. When you have two goalkeepers like that, who are, I suppose, valuable in their own way, one more than the other, are you not in some way forced into a decision between them? And do you not have to really give strong consideration to to cashing in on one of those assets? Yeah, I mean, you're 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 100 forced into a decision between them because the. Burnt Leno will be fit again and the first game of next season will roll around and Mikel Arteta has to pick one. Um, so from the, the the opening day, that's a decision right there. He is going to have to pick one of these goalkeepers, which right now is quite an, an unenviable task, I think. Mm. Um, when it comes to selling them, I I don't think now the now that Emmy Emmy Martinez has come into the team and played so well, uh, I don't think he will be satisfied. He's twenty six, I think. Twenty seven uh, now, I think. Twenty seven. I I don't think there's any way that he will be happy to go back to the bench. Um, these have been the performances of, and we don't know if they would continue longer term. Um, and everybody makes mistakes. Everybody goes through bad spells and you'd have to see how he'd cope with that. But these have been the performances of a, a first choice Premier League goalkeeper. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't see any way that he's happy to, to give that place up, which if then an offer were to come in or a, an inquiry were to come in for either of the players, then it does leave Arsenal with a massive decision because if you can sell one of those players who fingers crossed touch wood, if there are no injuries, wouldn't even play anyway next season, mm-hmm. then it's, it, it could be for a fee that we can sign one or maybe two players with that, which in our position, we've talked about those, those players that are unsellable. We need a lot of players and I don't think we'll get a lot of players. I don't think there'll be a lot of churn in the squad or not as much as we'd, we'd all maybe like in the summer. If you can suddenly sell a player for 20 million that you thought a few months ago that there was just not even a question of it, then I think you have to do it. Which, which one you sell is, is obviously a lot more difficult. Um, yeah. I mm. Like you say, after what <clears throat> Emmy Martinez would have played, nine or ten games by the time this season's up now. Yeah. Um it's it's not enough to decide, oh yeah, this is this is the guy that should be the first choice goalkeeper for the next four years. And that's the decision you're making as well. It's whichever one of them if you were to sell one, um whichever one you were to stick with, you're not making the decision short term. That's 
probably going to be Arsenal's goalkeeper for four or five years because there are God knows there are enough other positions we have mm. to look after. We not we can't twelve months from now afford to go shopping for a new first choice goalkeeper again. No, I mean it strikes me that Martinez is uh, Martinez rather is probably the um, the easier to sell if you like, because he's sort of uh, emerged as this um, surprise talent that clubs will have sat up and take uh, taken notice of. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a tricky situation for the club to try and consider because, you know, you, you, you do also need a good number two goalkeeper. Maybe you don't need two number ones. Um, I don't know that that's the right way to do it. Uh, Bernd Leno was basically the, the um, unquestionable number one until a few weeks ago, and now big questions uh, remain over that let's just talk more generally about squad building and uh, i've seen people posit this i think it was tim uh, tim stillman who sort of said that um the way liverpool built their squad was an interesting way and in that they got things right from an attacking point of view creative point of view first and then then put the the dam up if you like uh when it comes to the defense by buying Virgil van Dijk and Allison to really key players for them but before that they had invested in a lot of forward players they they'd spent money uh and they put together the the Mane Firmino Salah partnership in there and got that right i mean do you feel like that is a deliberate plan a ploy from their point of view or just a question of timing is that the right way to build a squad or or, you know, how, how do you view what Arsenal need to do? I mean, what is... I've had so many concerns about the defence and the defenders, and I don't think I'm alone there. But if you were to say, what is the big, big problem that needs to be fixed? Surely creativity and chance creation is almost bigger than that. Yeah, for me, 100%. Uh, creativity, chance creation, and just plainly goal scoring um with also which i think has not really been talked about that much but something that must have hindered Mikel Arteta in the the last two months since the games started up again mm. we've also been without Gabriel Martinelli which has left him with no option to rotate Aubameyang out or move Martinelli up front and then we've been left with these weird sub appearances where Joe Willock sort of plays up front for a little bit or yeah especially when um, when Eddie and Ketcher was banned, which is, yeah, that's that's also just hindered the, the team for a little while, I think, now. Um, I Yeah, personally, I would be of the opinion that, especially at that level, when you're talking about wanting to be a Champions League club again and even beyond that eventually, I think that talented players score goals and create chances. And that's something that, if you set up brilliantly, the the quality of players could still handcuff you in when it comes to to the final third. And I think the opposite of the of the defense. And I think we've seen that over the last few months. If you set up intelligently and everybody sticks with the plan, follows the plan, then I think the the structure of the team can not not protect all the defenders. There, there will be individual errors. There will be issues at the back. But I think it can mask it a lot more consistently than a good structure can help you mm. going forward. So I would lean really, really heavily into building that that front three or an attacking midfielder and going big there. This, I mean, I don't think Arsenal maybe can go big somewhere this summer. But if there's a, a place that needs emergency surgery right now, that's where it would be for me. I think at the back, we'll, we'll make howlers and we'll let goals in. But as long as the structure is good, it will be fewer goals than last year and the year before still. Mm. And I suppose we should point out that Arsenal do have William Saliba coming in. And, and you know I'm as keen as anybody to see him in the team, but also uh, be realistic about what an impact he might have as a 19-year-old coming from Liga to the Premier League. I think there's a, you know, there's a big, big step for him to make. So you need to be realistic about the, the, the level of performance and consistency you're going to get from him. But, but Pablo Marie as well is a, a player who you know, we did bring in in January. We're, we're yet to really know what kind of an impact he can have, um, particularly in a, 
uh, a back four, perhaps, on the left side of a back four, um, maybe harking back to that formation that Mikel Arteta played uh, when he first took over, where he, he used to drop Granit Xhaka back in, uh, almost into the back four as an auxiliary central defender. So there are, you know, there have been some recruitments in, in terms of defence. So it does mean that the, the midfield and creative midfield um in particular, could could get a boost. Does that hinge, though, Lewis, on 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 playing a back four and being able to play with three players in midfield and a front three, um, or is it possible to find that creative player who can play as part of a midfield to the way it's set up at the moment with Sabias and Shaka? Yeah, I don't. I don't think this. I don't think any system stops you from from being able to play a certain way and have a, a certain productivity. Everybody, or everybody who knows me anyway, um, knows that I watch Borussia Dortmund a lot, mm. and Borussia Dortmund spent the best part of two thirds of the season playing the, a similar shape to what Arsenal have been playing: three centre backs, uh, a sort of fluid front three and just two central midfielders. And uh, they ended up the season with uh, a, a club record uh, Bundesliga goal tally. Right. Um, they obviously did it with Jaden Sancho and Erling Haaland mm-hmm. and Marco Reus and Julian Brandt. And I think that's the that's the key that I, I know I keep coming back to, but I think it's the players. Um if you if you put, put those players in in the Arsenal team, then I don't think we're going to have any problem with creating chances and finishing a fair few of them. And yeah, for me, I I don't know. I think maybe it's harder to find the players that can excel when you're a little bit more conservative in your approach, and maybe they're left a little bit to to their own devices and mm. moments of individual brilliance. And I think if you obviously you play four three three or or four two three one and you can squeeze an extra attacking player in there, then we'd be we'd be better served. But even then, you look at and you, know, you talked about it with James last week. You look at how we we lined up at Wembley and at times and the and Southampton away as well. Kieran Tierney was the third centre back on the left, if you like. But when we get the ball, there's times that he shuffles out to to what looks just like an ordinary left back position and Maitland Niles or Saka at Southampton pushes on and the the shape isn't all that different mm. um to what it was when we were playing four at the back previously I, I think yeah uh, to not just sound like a broken record but I think ultimately this comes down to the personnel and maybe not enough players at Arsenal right now who are great in individual battles, 1v1, and just beating their man. Mm. And Nicola Pepe is one, but he's probably the only one. And then I think it becomes a lot easier for teams to double up on him. If you have in midfield one or two players like that as well, things become a lot, lot more difficult to handle for the opposition. You're a lot less predictable. And yeah, I think pretty much the the team the ball the way the ball, ball sort of being funneled through from the back to Xhaka or Ceballos and then it goes either into Lacazette or out wide it all is very samey and predictable and obviously against Liverpool and City where you've got a bit more space on the break it's fine mm. and we saw it against Spurs and we saw it against Villa again the other day when teams come in and sit in uh, a little bit more than the tools just aren't there to break them down. And a lot of our goals, even in the, the games where we've been better recently, have come from a couple of individual mistakes from Norwich, the one at Southampton, obviously the goals against Liverpool. Mm. And it's it's definitely something that I'm glad we have in our arsenal to, to press well and force those mistakes and capitalise on them. But ultimately, we're still Arsenal, and especially at home, but in the vast majority of our games, we're going to be left with 65% of the ball mm. and the onus is going to be on us to figure out a way to create something and break someone down. 
it is going to be fascinating to see what what sort of players we bring in during this uh, transfer period and who might be sacrificed to to raise money for that. Just before I let you go, just some final thoughts overall on the season because it is it is the last game of the season. Um, on Sunday, we we face Watford. We could relegate Watford, but it's been a stra- it's just been such a strange, weird season overall. Even leaving aside. The, the lockdown and the three months we had without football, it's very difficult, of course, to do that. But, you know, from a, from a, a club that's generally been, over the last number of years, really stable, this has been a very unstable season. You know, three managers, I know Freddie was a caretaker, but, you know, we began with Emery. We had Freddie for a little bit in the middle. We've ended with Mikel Arteta. There's been a lot going on this season and just your, your thoughts on on this one finally, eventually coming to an end. Um, yeah, it's it's been a while. Um, I'm, I'm glad it's coming to an end. I I think it's a shame because I think, obviously, we had Arsene Wenger leave two years ago now, um, Unai Emery's first season last season. And in an ideal world... Uh, well, in an ideal world, would have improved exponentially since Arsene Wenger left. Um, but I think r- realistically, these two seasons would have been best used really figuring out a, a direction and setting ourselves on that trajectory and figuring out what the squad should look like and which players should be gone and maybe a few new players that, that could be built around for the future. And we haven't really had that. Um, which I think is a big shame. I'm, yeah, I'm hopeful that that we're starting to get somewhere like that now, and that a younger team, William Saliba and Nicola Pepe and Bukayo Saka, can be those players for us for the next few seasons. Mm. That we sort of they can kick on and we build around that, and Gabriel Martinelli as well. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, it's been a it's been a weird one and I think it's probably taught everybody that we're just going to have to be quite patient and see how this goes now for the next few months at least but mm. probably for the next few years it's a good job that uh, patience is in such uh, great supply among <laughs> Arsenal fans uh, as we can see after everything uh, that goes wrong but look I think I think that's fair enough it'll be great to draw a line under this uh, particular uh, season from a Premier League point of view obviously we've got the FA Cup to come uh, Lewis thank you as ever for being here and we'll chat to you soon thank you Andrew you can follow Lewis on Twitter at LG Ambrose, at LG Ambrose, and you can read his tactics columns on the website on arsblog.com. Just go across the top to columnists and you'll find his name and you can read all the stuff that he's got going on there. And exclusively for Patreon members, we are going to be doing a tactics podcast that is launching soon and will be running throughout next season as well. So if you want access to that, as well as all the other stuff and to support everything that we do here on Arsblog, you can can sign up at patreon.com forward slash arsblog patreon.com forward slash arsblog for five euros per month plus vat if vat is applicable wherever you live right competition time arsenal's home shirt launched yesterday Uh, i'm not going to go through all the marketing bump but whichever version of that arsenal shirt you want you can have it could be the men's shirt, the goalkeeper shirt, the women's shirt, the junior shirt. Depending who wins it, they can pick whatever shirt they want in whatever size they want. All you have to do is answer this very, very simple question. Who is Arsenal's new number seven? Pretty easy. Just tell me who Arsenal's new number seven is. Email your answer, please, to competition at arsblog.com. That is competition at arsblog.com. We'll announce the winners on next week's show, next Friday's show, just ahead of the FA Cup final against Chelsea. So it's bound to be a busy week next week, but we do have Watford on Sunday. It's the final Premier League game of the season. Mikel Arteta is looking for his team just to bounce back from the Villa game and to sort of build a little bit of momentum, if that's possible, before the final. 
what sort of a team he's going to pick, I don't know. Do you risk your main men? Do you risk players who are going to be vital at Wembley? You know, we've played a lot of football and those guys have played a lot of football. So maybe, just maybe, they could do with a little bit of a rest. But Arteta wants to win the game. I suspect he might rotate just a little bit for this one uh, with the FA Cup final in mind. But we will see. As ever, we'll have live blog coverage of Arsenal versus Watford on Sunday. That is that in Premier League terms. Uh, until next season, whenever that starts, James and I will be here on Monday with an Arscast Extra, and we're going to have some podcasts for you next week as well in the build-up to the final. So we'll try our best to keep you entertained. So until then, take it easy, folks. Thanks for being here as always. Catch you on the next one. Cheers. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Robot Premier League. Human beings have been consigned to their own homes since the end of 2021 following the mutation of the coronavirus and the unfortunate incident at the Sellafield nuclear power plant involving Phil Collins. As such, all sporting events have been played by robots. Tonight's matchup is a classic at home. In the Republic of Islington, Arsenal taking on traditional rivals from the great desolate swamps of Middlesex, Tottenham. Let robot football commence! So, in the end, a convincing victory for Arsenal, 72-3. Down at the sideline, in conversation with Tottenham manager Jose Bot 2000, is our reporter, reporter Bot 2000. Jose, it was not your night tonight. That is the heaviest defeat in Tottenham's history. What do you put this down to? Jose Bot 2000, are you suggesting that somebody tampered with your robots? <coughs> this does not make sense. Robots do not eat lasagna. <coughs> no, they do not. <coughs> While you have been speaking, I have been performing unbelievably complex mathematical computations that provide us with the truth to this situation. Would you like to hear the truth? (coughs) You. Are. A. Fucking. Cunt. Back to you in Studio Clyde. Come screaming forward now, what will surely be their last attack? A good ball by Dixon Bot, finding Smith Bot, but Thomas Bot, charging through the midfield. Thomas Bot, it's up for grabs now!